Hello and welcome. What does it cost to lift the world's most needy people out of poverty? Could it be done with small sums instead of billions of dollars? Well, until my guest today made it a household name, few had heard of microcredit, especially those most needing it. His idea of giving loans of $50 or less to the poorest of the poor has helped millions to get out of the poverty trap. Now, Nobel Peace Prize winner Mohammed Yunus is bringing his Grameen Bank concept to America. The legendary Bangladeshi economist was in the United States this week to promote a new documentary about his efforts. The film is called To Catch a Dollar, Mohammed Yunus Banks on America and follows the attempt to launch Grameen stateside. So today we ask, how real is the dream of eliminating poverty with microcredit and can it help everyone in need? Remember, you can join our conversation with your questions and comments. You can send an SMS or an email, and we'll also take your phone calls onto the show. Now, I caught up with Professor Yunus at the sidelines of the East Coast premiere of his new documentary at the American Film Institute's Silver Theater in Washington, D.C.'s area. We examine the pros and cons of microcredit and start off with a conversation I had with him. Dr. Yunus, great to have you uh, here. I'm delighted to be here. It's interesting, the idea of... Uh, of your uh, microfinance coming to America, the, you know, the, a concept from one of the poorest countries in the world, helping the world's wealthiest and most powerful nation. What gave you that idea? Uh, well, uh, they have the same problem that we have in Bangladesh, only the magnitude is different. When you see in the United States all those payday loans charging 500%, 1,000% interest and flourishing, nobody does a thing about it. That shows the incompleteness in the banking system, the flaw. A gaping flaw in the banking system and then you see the pawn shops you see the check cashing companies so they need a different kind of banking to address those kind of things so this is a kind of banking that's a, a exact fit for those situations America tends to live with this idea there's no such thing as a free lunch and naturally there's a lot of suspicion when someone comes and says we don't have the same rules as the banks we're not going to chase you in the same way how did you win over the confidence of people to come and take part I think you got about 4,000 people already signed up yes indeed uh, they are not looking for if anybody making money or not they see whether they are getting the money and at what price that they're getting the money if the interest rate is low it's very reasonable for them and if they can get hold of some money to start on uh, whatever they're doing or expand whatever they're doing uh, it's an average loan in uh, New York City uh, for through Grameen America is about fifteen hundred dollars such an important amount that fifteen hundred dollars for them yeah now it's interesting I know when we've talked before about how it's worked in Bangladesh and other places it's it's very interesting how it empowers the women yes, and often the husbands are the ones or the male partners are very suspicious right. of what's happening how did you find that experience in America uh, they are suspicious they are worried because the power shifting uh, they fear that uh, as long as you are controlling the uh, money in the family uh, you have the power the moment the woman starts getting the money and start earning money uh, you f don't feel that you have the same control over her than you had before so they get very suspicious about it one and then they think that the women that the uh, bank is giving money will not be able to handle this money she doesn't know anything uh, she is not experienced like he is so she will make a mess of it and then he will be asked to pay the money so this is another fear for them. Both ways, they're not very supportive of the whole idea. But gradually, when we start doing this, in the first year, they have a lot of tension in the family. But after the first year, tension clears up because it's not as worrisome as it uh, used to think. The figures in America are quite startling. I mean, close to 40 million people in poverty. It's a large population. Yeah. Americans yet are known for being charitable. I mean, charity is almost institutionalized in America through tax relief and so on. But I know that you say the charity dollar only has one life. Explain that. Uh, Americans, in a way, they put a lot of money in charity. They say, when you look at the foundations, when you look at all this, it's almost like a trillion dollar uh, in the charity area, in the revenues and so on. Uh, but uh, I'm saying that it's not used the way uh, it should be. It could have been used if we could use it in a social business way where you don't want to make money out of it, but to solve the problem that we see as a problem of poverty or problem of health care, problem of environment, problem of housing. Uh, you could design all those social businesses, then this money will be recycling instead of uh, charity money going one way and never coming back. So every time you have to f 
feed the whole charity again and again with the money, fresh money coming in. So you achieve as a limited uh, kind of goal. But the moment you put it in a social business uh, structure, money recycles. Then with the same dollar, you get again and again the results that you wanted to intend. So you, your, your whole system becomes more powerful, brings more benefit to the people. How closely parallel is, is the response in America or the, the system in America, the mechanism in America, compared with what you've seen in places like Bangladesh, for example? I mean, does, does it work equally well in every, in every sector of the, the system? It does. It uh, works very well, and uh, we get a lot of support from you everybody. Get, you have 90, 99% repayment. In, in in more than 99%. In America In as America well. as well, yes. Yeah. In uh, New York City, it will be 99.3% repayment ever since we began. What happens if the people can't pay their loans? What is the sort of system, the mechanism, to make ensure that you have some kind of uh, sustainable structure? Sure. Uh, what we do, uh, we made our rules so that it's supportive of the borrower. Uh, so that she is not uh, put in a more misery, more problem than she started out with. Uh, we always think that uh, we bring this service to help people, not to make them more miserable. So if somebody cannot pay back, we will sit down how to overcome the problem she has, and we uh, bring uh, other women in the group to support her to see if she can come out of the problem she got into. And then we'll help her to redesign the repayment structure. Uh, we can reschedule it for a longer period so that each week uh, you'll be paying much less than what you were promised to do in the beginning, so that still you can do that. Uh, if you want to uh, take a fresh loan uh, so that you can start all over again, you can do the fresh loan also uh, if you have lost the money and so on, so that you can move on. Uh, our whole interest, our whole attention is to help the person rather than uh, protect the bank or protect the uh, business. It's interesting you say that, Dr. Yunus. If I can put to you a question we got from one of our viewers, they sent an email. Uh, Ramoji Ogaja Opanga Dieto wrote in saying, we can argue for or against Yunus's idea, but it has given hope to the forgotten of our society, women. We can only encourage him to improve it where it is not working as initially planned and also pressure our banking systems to change their tact. Do you see the, the, the mainstream banks, I mean, I know some of them have adopted the microfinance model. Have they seriously taken an interest in it? Uh, they uh, are supportive, but they have not opened the front door yet. They are providing support through their foundation window so that they could give a loan to a microcredit organization to support the women. Uh, but still their branches, their operations remain the same way they did. It's still poor people cannot come anywhere near them. Uh, so I would say uh, this is an improvement, but not all the way that they should go. They could open um, uh, separate specialized branches for poor people, so that if you feel that your uh, rich uh, client will not like poor people hanging around your premises, you can have a separate branch and uh, exclusively dedicated to the poor people and uh, lend the money, because it can be done, it can be uh, done as a business, uh, not, and it has been proven over and over again, year after year, uh, that it works. Would be a stigma associated with like kind of a two-tier banking system, the us and them, you don't think it would have created? No, I don't think so. There are always speci specialized banks, there are private banks, there are commercial banks, there's this kind of bank. You do that, this is another kind of bank, where we come with a non-collateralized loan because microcredit is without collateral. So we said this is a branch that's specialized in lending without collateral. There's nothing wrong with that. There's an irony that your banking is doing so exceptionally well when the mainstream banks have borrowed billions yes. to be bailed out. What is it that's, that's helped you be so successful in, 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 in this economic situation? Yes, I would say one of the things that uh, may, gave the strength to the microcredit program, microcredit is very close to the real economy. When you give a loan for $100, against that there are some chicken, there are some goats, there are some cows or something. It's a one-on-one -on -one relationship. Uh, the conventional bank got into trouble because they are creating a fantasy economy. Uh, far removed from the real economy. They are chasing papers. They don't know what these papers mean. And one piece of that thing fell and the whole thing collapsed. That fantasy blew away. So that was a problem. Uh, banking should try to remain uh, rooted in the ground rather than uh, kind of fly in the sky. That leads me to another question from a viewer. Ansan Bhatt wrote in saying, what will be the future of traditional banks? 
in your opinion? Uh, it's, this is a crisis. That we are in the deepest of the crisis of the financial system. And this gives us an enormous opportunity to redesign things. When things work, you don't want to touch it, no, don't want to uh, fool around with it. But here is a crisis, so we can uh, go and redesign, re reconceptualize, and make the whole system work uh, the way we intended it to do, uh, making it inclusive so that nobody is excluded from the banking system. And that's a complaint that we are making, that the bulk of the majority of the people are left out from the system. And it's not a healthy system which leave out uh, majority of the world population. So this would be a good time to uh, re redesign that. In that redesigning, still there will be uh, the banking for the rich, but it will also have a continuum reaching out to the beggars on the other end. So this is what uh, we should be coming up with. Interestingly enough, you've not been given a license to be a bank, though, in America, have you? No, it's not that they refuse to do it. It's simply, it's too expensive for us to ask for it. It takes millions of dollars, something like $35 million or something, as equity to start a bank. But uh, microfinance is not something that you can start with $35 million in uh, equity. Uh, we are saying that why can't we create a separate legislation uh, for microcredit banks, which doesn't need that kind of money, maybe uh, $50,000, maybe $100,000, you can start that kind of bank. Uh, after all, uh, uh, conventional National bank is like a, a big uh, tanker, super tanker, goes into the deep sea with lots of cargo in it. And uh, uh, microcredit bank is like a dinghy boat. It goes into shallow water, reach out everybody and deal with the small money. So you should not be the same architecture, the legal architecture that you use for conventional bank, ask them to do the same thing for the uh, little bank, that microfinance bank. We have a question here, if I may, from uh, Lola Mohammed Noor, who wrote in saying, some critiques of microcredit have been that it is not enough to truly eradicate poverty and it does not really help the poorest of the poor. What's your response to that? Also, has there been enough research done to prove the long-term effects of microcredit? Do you see microcredit as a long-term and thorough solution to poverty? Yeah. Well, there are lots of research going on in microcredit. Um, uh, for, for example, Grameen Bank uh, has become the subject of uh, many, many researches. Many books have been written about it. Many dissertations, dissertations have been written about it. And always coming up with a very positive finding that the things that change within the family, with impact on the women, impact on their children, and the impact on future, and so on and so forth. So there are tons of those uh, stories and the uh, evidences have been documented. Uh, and we never say that uh, microcredit alone will solve all the problem. People kind of put it in a pedestal and they say you, they are, you don't deserve it. We didn't say that we have to do everything about poverty. Poverty eradication need education, poverty education, technology, poverty, many things. But we say Credit is a very important component, don't forget that. If you put the credit component, you create the uh, platform, and other things become easy to bring technology, bring education, bring training, and so on and so forth. This is what you're saying. So final quick thought, when watching your uh, documentary, To Catch a Dollar, fascinating, you, you tell the stories of some of the successes and challenges you faced in America. At the end of the movie, I noticed that it says, you know, your goal is to open up throughout the United States. Do you think the US has the capacity to absorb this concept uh, across the country? Is it too ambitious to try and get across the whole of America? Uh, it's not the U.S. side that uh, we'll be worrying about, whether the Grameen has the capacity to do that kind of thing. Each one is independent. When you do it in Washington, D.C., which will be opening very soon, we, right now we have in New York and uh, we have in Omaha, Nebraska, uh, we'll be opening it in uh, Washington, D.C., another is coming up in San Francisco. So each one is independent. Each one has to take care of itself. Uh, if it is self-sustaining, there's no reason why you cannot do as many as you want because each one is taking care of itself. You lend money, you get your money back, and you get your interest to cover all your costs. As long as it's sustainable, I don't think there's any limit. You can go as far as you can go if you can have the good administration to run those things. Well, Dr. Yunus, I wish you luck. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Appreciate it's it. Thank pleasure. You, Thanks a lot. Well, after the break, we go to Ann Arbor, Michigan, where international management strategist Professor Anil Karnani has a different take on the microcredit revolution. We'll be right back. Welcome back. We're examining the concept of microcredit, which has just been introduced in a unique way into the U.S. by Nobel Peace Laureate Dr. Muhammad Yunus, who's often called the father of microfinance. 
We just heard his reasoning behind it, but now we ask, what is the downside? And when does a microloan hurt more than it helps? Joining me now is Dr. Anil Karnani, Professor of Strategy at the School of Business at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, from where he joins us. Dr. Karnani, good to have you with us, sir. Let me start by asking you what your, your biggest objection or at least biggest concern is when it comes to microfinance. I think the biggest problem with microfinance is that's not really effective at reducing poverty as the proponents claim. So there's too much hype about microfinance and the reality is not nearly as positive. Where do you see the, where do you see the, the, the sort of mismatch between the concept and the, uh, or at least the, the belief and the reality? I mean, in what way? It seems that it's such a large industry. It seems to be dealing with billions of dollars and it seems that millions of people are involved in, in at least benefiting from it. That's true. The biggest problem with microfinance is that it embodies a very romanticized notion about the poor. It assumes that the poor are really entrepreneurs and that with a little bit of capital, we can unleash this entrepreneurial energy and they will go out and start businesses and create flourishing businesses and rise out of poverty. Well, the reality is that most people, not just poor people, but most people are not really entrepreneurs. They don't have the skills, the drive, the vision, the creativity to be entrepreneurs. Well, Even in a rich country like the US, I'm sorry. No, oh, sorry, sir, I was just going to ask you then, yeah. Go, go, carry on, carry on with your thoughts, sir. Even in a rich country like the US or Western Europe, more than 90% of the labor force chooses not to be an entrepreneur and in fact has a salaried job. Most people don't want the risk or the, don't have the skills to be an entrepreneur. And the poor are no different in that. I wonder, sir, though, you know, obviously the difference is in, in a developed uh, country, there, there is a, a greater prospect of being employed and having an infrastructure for employment, whereas if for many of these people in, in the uh, developing world, there is no such infrastructure and any kind of uh, work may be uh, only possible if they can generate it. So surely having that opportunity to, to be self-starting is, is better, better than nothing. I mean, what would you propose as an alternative? You're right. It is better than nothing, but we need to channel our energies differently both financial capital and energies towards creating jobs that the poor can have. These would be jobs that have low skill requirements and have some of the benefits of a stable job. But you're right, doing microfinance is better than doing nothing. But that's the false alternative. We shouldn't do nothing. We should try to create appropriate jobs for these poor people. I guess uh, one of the, the issues, Professor, is that in, in the job sort of creation industry, especially in the developing world, there's a lot of exploitation, and at least this puts the, the A, the incentive, the onus, and the, and the motivation into the hands of those who are taking those microloans, but also of, hopefully will keep them out of the, uh, the hands of those who would exploit them. Well, that is true, that going to a moneylender is worse, but there are charges that even the microfinance organizations are exploitative at least some of them, not all of them, of course. Mm -hmm. There was a famous incident in India a few years ago where about 200 farmers in Andhra Pradesh allegedly commit suicide because of intimidation by microfinance organizations. But there is evidence that MFIs, the microfinance institutions, can also be exploitative on three dimensions. The first is that the interest rates they charge are very high. The average interest rate is in the range of 30 to 50 percent, and some of them go as high as 100 percent interest. A second is there is no transparency in this. They tell you they charge you one interest, but they add on a lot of hidden charges so that the effective interest rate is much higher. And the third is sometimes the recovery practices for bad loans can be abusive too. So if nothing else, we need to at least regulate microfinance. It's interesting you say that, sir, because we had an email, if I may put it to you, sir, that came from uh, North Carolina in the USA, or Richard, where he says, how is the model regulated by the federal and state governments? Who puts up the money? What happens when the borrower defaults? I mean, certainly, in the, the question is the, the issue of regulation, which you've raised here. Exactly. And this is very under-regulated industry in these poor countries. And this situation is made worse by the fact that the borrowers are often illiterate, certainly ill-informed, and definitely don't know much about finances or calculating net present value or interest rates. And so there is a lot of potential here for exploitation. Yeah. But I don't think most Go institutions ahead. are exploiting them, but some are. 
So there was a couple of email questions on a similar subject, if I may put these to you, because we, ra we raised the issue of the interest rates. The first one comes in from Malaysia, if I may uh, read this one from Mahmoud Kasim. says, some microfinance institutions charge as much as 5% interest per month, making it 60% interest, uh, 60 interest per year. It isn't unjust, uh, is it, sorry, isn't it unjust, exploitative, and unethical for an institution that is meant to bridge the unbanked masses' needs for financial needs to charge such high rates? The second one comes from Nazima Sumar. Uh, who says micro lending in South Africa has a negative stigma attached as the lenders or loan sharks as they are referred to attach a very high interest rate that eats up an already impoverished population now I mean loan sharks apart uh, some of the, the, the you know the uh, examples you gave surely that, that in some of these cases they're not the sort of uh, sort of genuine uh, well-wishing microfinance organizations they are ex actually exploitative surely there should be some way to separate those that are trying to do something positive and and perhaps not exploiting the poor uh, from those who are taking advantage of the branding and and riding on the bandwagon that's right and the only way to do that would be some sort of regulation and increasingly the microfinance field is attracting for-profit companies into the field because it is a very profitable business there is very little competition the borrower is ill-informed and vulnerable, and the repayment rates are very high, so it can be a very profitable business. There was a famous case in Mexico of a microfinance bank called Compartmos that went public and made hundreds of millions of dollars in profit, largely because they were charging interest rates in the range of about 100% per year. I wonder, sir, just a quick thought as we've got uh, 30 seconds or so left, uh, whether or not you feel that there is a prospect to bring in this regulation to actually utilize the benefits of microfinance and eliminate those risks we've been discussing. I think there may be potential for that, but my view is that we need to channel our energies and resources into other areas besides microfinance. Microfinance, even if it is regulated well, I don't think will reduce poverty significantly. Right. Because the basic problem is that the poor are not really entrepreneurs. They are more entrepreneurs by necessity than by choice. Okay. And the businesses they start are very low scale, well, have too much competition, kind of are undifferentiated, mm -hmm. and they don't really earn enough money to rise out of poverty. There, sir, unfortunately, I have to stop you. I thank you so much for your contribution to the debate. Thank you. Thanks for being with us too. Now, remember, you can watch a podcast of the tune of the show on iTunes. This week, we're featuring a discussion on the Maoists in India who claim the country's poor are not benefiting from the country's economic growth and are waging war against India's security forces. On the next show, can Islam go to Hollywood? We'll speak with the producers of an upcoming big-budget film about the Prophet Muhammad and look at the challenges of making Islam more accessible to the mainstream audience. That's it for now. For me and the team, see you next time.